So there we go. We've got killing from a safe distance. What does the removal of risk mean for the military profession? So we're going to talk about some uh, military ethics. All right, cool. So. Yeah, so we've got. Yeah, so we're killing from a safe distance. What does the removal of risk mean for the military profession by Peter Olsthorn in the Washington University Review of Philosophy? So, here we go. Yeah. In World War II, the Japanese Navy armed some of their submarines with manned torpedoes, which, different from the manned torpedoes that Italy, the UK, and Germany used, offered no chances of survival for their volunteering pilots. The pilots of these chitons were sacrificed for a rather minimal increase in accuracy. The use of chitons reminds somewhat, reminds somewhat of Japanese kamikaze attacks from the same era, but also of the suicide bombings we have witnessed in more recent years. Although cultural factors such as the Japanese shame culture of that time no doubt did play a role in motivating these Kaiten pilots, culture is only part of the explanation. RAF airmen in the Second World War continued to fly their bombing missions over Germany while knowing that their chances of surviving a tour of duty were slim. Today, however, with military personnel increasingly fighting far from home in conflicts in which the survival of one's own political community is not at stake, we see the proliferation of a technology that is, in essence, the opposite of the manned torpedo. Unmanned aerial ve vehicles or drones make it possible to fight the enemy from a very safe distance. Viper says, I don't want them to remove risk from the military, but I do want them to remove monopoly from the economic profession. Um... You know, I was just thinking, uh, are we going to, can we, can we put, there's a lot of risk in economics and can we put, uh, I was thinking, can, does that mean there's a lot of monopoly in the military? And I was like, yeah, that's also true too. No, I mean, that makes sense. You want people to take like the harms that come with war very seriously and you don't want people to, uh, and then in economics you need to prevent monopolies yes but i mean we need to find ways to, and i think that's what this paper is going to be ultimately about once you know war is a video game and uh like was this ender's game or whatever once war is just like a removed video game it's different you don't act the same you don't treat things the same when you don't think it's real so and that's the other part of your comment is like monopoly is this is quite often how people see it is at a game when people's lives and, you know, their futures and all that, like their kids educations are on the line. And, you know, they go YOLO on the uh, Bed Bath and Beyond stock. <coughs> OK, in the military, in the military, the dominant view seems to be that using unmanned systems that reduce the risks for military personnel involved to near zero is not very different from using artillery or aircrafts that drop bombs from a high altitude. It is perhaps to stress the lack of difference that some within the military prefer the term remotely piloted over the more eerie sounding unmanned. In this view, an armed drone is just another weapon system, and as such, it is neither good nor bad. It is only the way it is used that can be said to be ethical or unethical. This idea that nothing is essentially changed with the coming of unmanned systems echoes Machiavelli's idea that each new development in warfare has its analogy in ancient times, which most of the time can be found in the work of Livy, and that, for instance, firearms do not really differ from catapults of old. History proved Machiavelli wrong on the last point. We now know. According to others, not sharing Machiavelli's static view of history, the use of unmanned systems and the riskless killing they make possible do raise a host of new issues, for instance, about the civilian casualties they can cause or the way they lower the bar for resorting to uses of force. Yeah. Hey, Victor Sor, what's up? How you doing? I hope you're doing well. Yeah, I know. This is this is why I wanted to read. Uh, whenever you get into like military ethics, things you know get interesting quick sometimes and i do like that you get different topics different philosophers uh, pop up 
So, um, this is the thing again. Is like the I do agree that lowering the bar for resorting to the use of force is not a good thing. You have to be very careful when pulling triggers, and it does seem to be easier to pull triggers when you don't have to go there and do it yourself. Among these issues is also the more existential question to what extent the willingness to take risks is in fact part of the military profession. I mean, you don't want wusses. You don't want people not willing to take risks in uh, the military, like well, anywhere else for that matter too. Interestingly, such more profound questions are more mostly raised by critics from outside the military who are justifiably worried that killing might become a bit too easy when there is no risk for one's own side. From their point of view, the use of unmanned armed drones is very different from using manned aircraft. This article questions to what extent risk is an essential element of the military profession and whether the, elimi uh, the elimination of all risk would make the profession a less moral one. To that extent, the next section describes a dominant view within the military that there is nothing morally wrong with riskless killing by means of drones, while the section after that depicts the more critical view that such riskless killing is unethical. Okay, so this is interesting. We're getting an outline of why you might think that it is perfectly okay to have just like push a button and have someone die. I mean, it's a good question. If you wanted them dead anyway, what, what's it matter how? Many people working in the military will argue that risk is not or is no longer a defining element of what it means to be a military professional. War fighting is not a game which benefits from contenders of roughly equal strength, and you could maintain that the more unfair the odds are, the better it is, perhaps even for the losing party. Yeah, I mean, the idea is that if you lose so quick that you don't, like, you just, you get trampled and then, so the damage is really minimal, maybe that is better just to concede. I don't think the people who lose feel that way, though. Although war is occasionally compared with sport, it is a very different activity. War should be, of course, war should, of course, be fair, fought fairly in the sense that one has to fight by the rules laid down by the, down in the laws of armed conflict and by and the just war tradition. But that is an altogether different story. That war may be unfair in the sense of uneven implies that there is nothing wrong with attaining your objectives and this can involve killing enemy combatants without incurring any risk to yourself. Bradley J. Strasser, an associate professor of philosophy at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, argues along that line that there is a moral duty to use unmanned aircraft based on what he calls the principle of unnecessary risk. I just want to point out, this sounds exactly or very similar to the uh, Sun Tzu, that you should use all the spying you should and like undermine the uh, someone else's con uh, country because that will save more lives in the long run by doing things that are of less risk to uh, yourself by, you know, having spies and undermining someone else's country. You don't actually need to go fight the war. And this is the same sort of thing. It sounds like, okay, why would you go increase risk to yourself just use the unmanned aircraft take out the enemy and then you're done you don't have to do it were you taught in school that dropping the a-bomb in world war ii saves lives vipers you're assuming we were taught history in school i'm american remember that <coughs> um i'm trying to remember if i was taught anything about world war ii i don't remember i don't I, i'm sure they taught us something i i don't remember I will say that in my school, um, I may have had two good social studies teachers, one in seventh grade and one in, well, some of the, some, of, some of them were very bad. Oh, let me just put it that way. Not all of them were bad, but some of no, some of them were very good and some of them were very bad. And frankly, yeah, so <coughs> I'm sure that was mentioned at least once but like the idea that i was taught that i don't know if i was taught anything <laughs> i taught that at least i mean this is america we do get the rah rah we won world war ii but exactly how uh, that got won i don't remember if that uh was specified so clearly okay so the principle of unnecessary risk yeah, when you first heard, it is a shocking thing, but I don't know if, uh, 
how people predict like what saves lives like killing some people saves other lives i mean it i don't know exactly how those calculations are made like that doesn't yeah i have no idea what people are thinking in that case all right the principle of nsa risk this principle holds that if x gives y an order to accomplish a goal g a good goal g then x has an obligation other things being equal to choose a means to accomplish g that does not violate the demands of justice make the world worse or expose y to potentially lethal risk unless incurring such risk aids in the accomplishment of g in some way that cannot be gained via less risky means yeah i mean the idea that we could just go blow up all the non-military people is crossing a line that we had not crossed i think before that like we weren't just blowing up civilians and uh the idea that like killing civilians is a good way to end war is I don't think it's a good way to end war, really. Well, I don't know what a good way to end war is, really. But, like, it's terrible to go do that, though. It's not... Yeah, it's just terrible. Okay. So, basically, they're saying, look, the, you should do everything as least risky as possible unless there is no other way to do it. Uh, and risky to your own uh, life, that is. Okay, from, from that principle follows that military and political leaders have a duty to protect an agent engaged in a justified act from harm to the greatest extent possible so long as that protection does not interfere with the agent's ability to act justly. UAVs offer precision precisely such protection. Therefore, we are obligated to employ UAV weapon systems. Yeah, basically, why ever put yourself at risk if you don't have to? And it's like, why wouldn't you? Despite the fact that war does not have to be a fair fight, we do regularly encounter examples of soldiers displaying sportsmanlike behavior. There are famous examples of soldiers deciding not to take aim at lone soldiers who form too easy a target. The best known case in point is the naked soldier from Robert Graves' World War I memoirs. Graves decided not to shoot an unaware bathing enemy soldier that Michael Walter uses as an example of just fighting in his 1977 class classic Just and Unjust Wars. Walter sympathizes with these reluctant shooters. Understandably, showing mercy to defenseless enemy soldiers intuitively seems like the right thing to do. In her recent book on cooperation and war, Conspiring with the Enemy, The Ethics of Cooperation and Warfare, Yvonne Chu, an associate professor at the U.S. Naval War College, illustrates with many more examples how soldiers have now and again felt uncomfortable with sniping and ambush, as some within the military might feel uncomfortable today about drone killing. However, Chu believes, given that war does not have to provide combatants with equal opportunity, the reluctant sh shooters are positing a category mistake. Soldiers who make themselves into an easy target either lack confidence themselves or fail to correctly appraise that of their enemy, and war tests those very things. Hmm. Okay. On this view, and from a legal perspective too, naked soldiers form a legitimate target. One could even argue that there is something tragic about the sportsmen like snipers who let vulnerable enemy soldiers walk. Their acting honorably in their wish for a fair fight can prolong a war and thus increase the total amount of harm that the war causes. While intended, efforts to reduce suffering might be in the end do more harm than good. The more even, uneven a war is, the sooner it will be over. That somewhat echoes Clausewitz's remark that kind-hearted efforts to minimize bloodshed misapprehend the logic of war, or General Sherman's observation that war is hell and that you cannot refine it, with the important difference that Sherman and Clausewitz saw little to no role for law and ethics in war, while most uh, authors who point out the permissibility of killing naked soldiers do see a role for the two. Viper says, well, my monitors are cleaner than they have been in months, you asshole. I do what I can. Military and political leaders, meanwhile, prefer their wars as asymmetrical as possible and will do their best to avoid putting soldiers in a fair fight. According to Walter, sparing soldiers who form an easy target was and is the exception, and the rules of war do not require soldiers to abstain from riskless killing. What's more, as a result of a lot of money and effort, modern militaries are getting better at killing without getting killed. The general feeling within the armed forces seems to be that there are mainly advantages in this development of riskless warfare. I never ever want to see a sailor or marine in a fair fight. I always want to have them 
want them to have the advantage. U.S. Admiral Ruffhead said after witnessing a demonstration of a railgun and electromagnetic cannon with a range of over 200 miles. Te technological developments clearly play an important role in getting the upper hand. In 1969, Chief of Staff and former Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Forces in Vietnam, General William C. Westmoreland predicted in a talk for the annual Luncheon Association of the United States Army that on the battlefield of the future, enemy forces will be located, tracked, and targeted almost instantaneously through the use of data links, computer-assisted intelligence evaluation, and automated fire control. Today, machines and technology are permitting economy of manpower on the battlefield, as indeed they are in the factory. But the future offers even more possibilities for economy. I am confident the American people expect this country to take full advantage of its technology to welcome and applaud the developments that will replace wherever possibly the possible the man with the machine. Interestingly, where many in the military see notions about heroism and military honor as outdated, a lot of people outside the military still still harbor such views and do see risk as an essential element of what it means to be a military man or woman. You know, this is just like one of these things where it's like, you know what we're doing right here? This is what the uh, this is the beginning of Terminator when, you know, we turn all of our like stuff over to the machines and we're letting them do all the thinking for us and also the Matrix for that matter. This is exactly like the start of all these like uh, 80s and 90s uh, sci fi uh, things. Um, but yeah, I can see why in this sort of view of the military as an economic thing what is the most efficient way to achieve your goal well why would you put people out there when you could just put a machine out there people are harder to replace you can just make another machine so simple <coughs> so that's the question what do you do and why wouldn't you do the most economical thing, saving the most lives on your side? You want war to be as asymmetric as you can, to the point as, going back to the Sun Tzu, you should be undermining the country right now, and so you don't even have to fire a shot, they are just going to collapse on their own, and you can just waltz in and take over as you want. So, I mean, this is not a new thought on what counts as the economy of warfare. So why should we make it more economically damaging? Well, that's the question. Is risk an essential element of what it is to be in the military? Okay, three, the willingness to take risks as proof of good intentions. It was only a few years after Westmoreland predicted a applause from the American people for the technical war warfare of the future that psychiatrist Robert J. Lifton, basing himself on many therapy sessions with Vietnam veterans, wrote very critically about what he called numbed warfare. Psychologically speaking, there are two ways to kill in war. There is the classic way of reducing one's victims to non-human status, to Huns, to com or communists, or gooks, or simply enemy, so that one is merely getting rid of beasts, devils, scum, or threatening obstacles. And there is the more recent method of technological distancing, of being so far removed from one's victim that, psychologically, he does not exist at all. This type of warfare, writes Lifton, is conducted with a self-enclosed system. The fighter's only psychological contact are with military superiors or peers and with his equipment. Lacking any relationship with his victims, the numbed warrior receives receives from them very little of the feedback that could permit at least one layer of his mind to perceive those victims as humans. He does not, therefore, require a dehumanizing gook syndrome, since, psychologically speaking, no one is there to be rendered into a gook. Those who bomb need not feel the searing inner conflict of the former ground troops. In numbed warfare, the enemy is nothing but blips, and he says, and says one commentator who lift in, quote, a blip is worse than a gook. I apologize for all the uh, slurs, but like when I'm quoting, I read them. Um, I don't use them normally. Yeah, it, it, uh, very familiar. But like, I think what is nice about this is um, this is probably a very old quote, and so this is this may be going back to one of the first times that this was explicitly stated. Um, so this is kind of nice. Like, I want um, let's uh, let's see. We are on page four right now. Let's go look at what uh, footnote 15 is. Yeah, 1972. 
So this is nice because uh, it, it may sound familiar, but it also is a... Um, this may be one of the first times this was uh, explicitly stated that this is the sort of thing that uh, is happening where the technology stands in between us and we can uh, dehumanize through the technology. To be fair, the all the stuff that we, they were talking about beforehand where you are, you know, putting someone into a non-human category, that is a very similar thing. It's just a different kind of technology. You're thinking of them as not the same sort of uh, being as you, but like you're using um, co concepts to do it as opposed to the technology which changes the way you actually observe them. And so that's the only difference here. It's a different kind of technology, but it's still technology. It's a conceptual uh, scheme that you're using to you know, reduce the victims to something non-human. But when you're looking at them through a, a screen that is also a technology, is just of a different kind. So you can sort of think that this isn't so different. Okay, Lifton's criticism of technological warfare foreshadowed much of the contemporary censure of riskless warfare. Political science Peter W. Singer quote, quotes in his Wired for War, a UAV pilot in Qatar, who said about his job, it's like a video game. It can get a little bloodthirsty, but it's fucking cool. Since then, we've learned that this is probably not how most drone pilots experience their work. In reality, writes drone expert and former British RAF champ, uh, Chaplain and lecturer Peter Lee on the basis of his research into British Reaper teams, physical separation from the combat zone does not automatically lead to emotional disconnection. The crew of a tornado flying at a low level above an enemy contact may be more emotionally disengaged than the Reaper crew. Just like other military personnel, drone pilots might suffer from PTSD and moral injury. In that sense, drone warfare is not riskless at all. No, I mean, it's going to be a different kind of risk, of course, because when you're physically there, you could be distracted by other things, but like you get physically shot when you're not at physical risk. You may have a, a more significant uh, emotional and psychological weight on you because um, you are not distracted. Despite these nuances, Singer's portrayal of drone warfare as something resembling a video game appears to have set the tone. I mean, it's a great image. Why wouldn't that set the tone? In more than one publication, drones are called death machines. The term killer robot seems reserved for autonomous drones. While the comparison of flying a drone with playing a video game seems to have stuck negatively affecting the public opinion on drones. Clearly, the idea of killing without the risk of being killed goes against widespread, or at least outside the military, intuitions about what is just and proper. A week after the 9-11 suicide attacks, Susan Sontag remarked that if the word cowardly is to be used, it might more aptly applied, be applied to those who kill from beyond the range of retaliation high in the sky than to those willing to die themselves in order to kill others. Whatever may be said of per the perpetrators of Tuesday's slaughter, they were not cowards. And what's interesting was, uh, uh, what's this, Bill Maher said something very similar. He got a lot of trouble for that. Although many disagree with what Sontag wrote about the terrorists, perhaps fewer took issue with her evaluation of those who killed from beyond the range of retaliation. Ironically, the wars that followed 9-11 attack gave an impetus to the type of riskless killing that Sontag condemned. Not surprisingly, according to some observers, this type of killing is also immoral in the eyes of many who live in the areas where drones operate. Journalists Ghosh and Thompson learned that the use of drones was seen as dishonorable and cowardly in the parts of Pakistan where drones killed many Taliban leaders. A commander of the Pakistan Taliban claimed that each drone attack brought him three or four suicide bombers, mostly from the families of the victims. Also outside such strongholds of honor, many will feel that the use of armed drones is miles away from what is normally understood by the term honorable. Incurring risk to oneself seems to be an essential part of it. Um, maybe it's risk to oneself. I'm not sure if that's all of it. Um, it feels like this new sort of warfare that we have where you push a button and someone blows up on the other side of the world. It feels like, you know, it's an unhuman sort of thing to do where I push this button here and like, you know, you guys see me over on on another part of the world that's a very unusual thing there's some sort of honor in it not necessarily the risk but you know being with another person and understanding they understand who killed them and you killed them like who you're battling against you have no understanding of another person uh here uh yeah so shane would be very helpful on these sorts of discussions but you know shane can't always be here miss shane yeah um 
Yeah, I really, I can't even fake understanding what Shane knows about all these topics. He knows way more. So, but I mean, even if he isn't an expert in this, he's probably knows way more kinds of battles in the past and how different the military tactics are being used now. And so, like, the concept of military tactics is, whatever we're doing now is very different from, like, the what we were doing in the past. And so, yeah, like, if you want to treat someone honorably, you're treating them like you want to be treated. No one wants to just, you know, get blown up. Like, it, it seems like you haven't even got a chance. And, and it's not even a chance to, like, cause risk or harm to the other person. A chance to survive, in some sense. It seems like if you were smart enough or clever enough, you could get away from it. But, like, this is removing any chance of, uh, you know, escape. And that, that sort of feels like, you know, that is the point of war that you are, uh, you know, winning. Like, the other person can't escape. But, like, also, in some sense, it feels like that poor person, it just they're, by being born wherever they were born, they're, you know, they just are going to die now because through no fault of their own, they're just in, asymm in an asymmetric situation where they have no chance. And that feels, um, it's not chance to cause you harm, it's just chance to even survive themselves and you can at least feel somewhat bad for people who are you know condemned to death basically at that point okay if we turn to military ethics and more specifically to just war theory we see a similar sentiment michael walzer for instance although admitting that honor and chivalry seem to play only a small part in contemporary combat nonetheless places great value on soldiers being willing to take risks that becomes especially clear in what he writes about the principle of double effect in just war theory. That principle essentially states that civilian casualties are permitted as long as they are accidental and their expected number proportional to the anticipated military advantage. Viper says, in terms of concepts, of, in terms of concepts being a technology, it reminds me of Dan Dennett's ideas to die for. This is what our summon bonum is. It is, it's not maximizing the number of grandchildren we have. This is a profound biological effect. It's the subordination of genetic interests to other interests, and no other species does anything at all like it. Yeah, this is the thing. You can think of religion as a way of controlling people. You can think of like uh, these philosoph uh, philosophical ideas as ways of like you know modifying behavior these are different sorts of conceptual schemes they have different effects different rituals that make people do different things and so the technology as we see it um in sort of a like physical sense is not really um like if you look at philosophy of technology it gets really radical um yeah, exactly, Vipers. Religion, capitalism, communism, economic systems, religious systems, political systems, all these things have different effects on, you know, people and are used to different uh, purposes, basically. And so the technology in terms of, like, you know, electronic uh, systems we have now, it's a different sort of thing, but it's quite often that it's being applied to similar ends. And so it's not that different in terms of what these other systems are doing. It's a way of organizing ourselves to achieve ends. And when we have new tools, we organize ourselves differently. <coughs> okay, yeah, so we're saying, look, you have to have that civilian casualties are permitted as long as it, it's accidental and it's proportional to the uh, military advantage. Walter thinks this principle of double effect is much too lenient in its traditional formulation. Simply not to intend the def death of civilians is too easy. In that traditional understanding, the principle of double effect requires little effort on the part of the military to minimize civilian casualties, as long as the latter are an unintended and proportional side effect to leg of legitimate attacks on military targets. These attacks are within the principle's limits. This is especially because of the principle's leniency that Walter restates it in his Just and Unjust Wars, arguing that soldiers have a further obligation to attend to the rights of civilians and that due care should be taken. However, it, it is not enough that soldiers do their best to avoid civilian casualties as much as possible. They have to do this accepting costs to themselves. I mean, that's interesting. What is the cost you have to accept to yourself? Within due limits, of course. 
This adds up to what Walter calls the idea of double intention, with the first intention being that it is the intention to hit the target and not something else. The second and here more relevant intention consists of two rather separate aspects. One, efforts should be made to reduce the number of civilian casualties. Two, if necessary, at increased risk to oneself. It is, of course, the second part that is rather demanding, and it is precisely because it is demanding that Walter thinks we would like to see it. We look for a sign of positive commitment to save civilian lives. That says that if saving civilian lives means risking soldiers' lives, the risk must be accepted. Well, see, this is what I mean before. It's like if you're, it's not necessarily that we're risking something to ourselves. It's that you're treating those other people like they don't matter, like they're at that point, like their lives don't matter as much as yours. And that's why Walter's saying, look, you have to also risk yourself because that would put, that makes you realize that their life is of value. Like your life is of value. That seems excessive to like wanting to put yourself in danger unnecessarily, but how else do you actually impress upon a person that the person that they're killing is still a human being that should be uh, treated as such? Interestingly, it is we that must accept, that look for a sign of positive commitment, suggest that it is intentions perceived by us, not consequences suffered by others, that matters most to Walter. That Walter writes in a later essay that the acceptance of risk is the best way to assess the seriousness of the intention to avoiding uh, to avoid harming civilians points in the same direction. In the end, a sincere effort to avoid c- civilian casualties is considered more important than whether or not that effort is, in fact, successful. Yeah, so it's like if you're willing to put yourself out there then you at least are recognizing that you know you're willing to do it because you you're treating their lives as valuably as yours now if you're just an idiot about it and you kill a lot of people well at least you were just as uh likely to die in the uh situation which you know that just allows for that just allows for politicians to uh throw our military at the problem and that's not really good it, that's just the uh, cannon fodder theory um that if you're willing to you know use your own people as cannon fodder then it's okay to treat the other people as cannon fodder um that's not great either but yeah you still have to be willing to do that in some sense <coughs> to uh, accept the level of like requisite risk in killing a lot of people you have to be willing to take on the equal proportionate amount of risk for yourself Eh. yeah at first sight this reformulation of the principle is a sensible one as it raises the bar in cases that civilian deaths are although not intended foreseen it can be seen as a criticism of what martin shaw calls risk transfer and is the new western way of war western militaries look for ways to deliver firepower without risks risk casualties among their own military personnel but this generally happens at the cost of more risk to the local population Politicians and militaries tend to see casualties among the local population as less important than casualties among their own military personnel. A case in point, the 1999 Kosovo War, which cost the lives of about 500 civilians, ended without deaths at ended without deaths at the side of NATO. Although about 35% of the bombs and missiles used were smart, military ethicist Martin Cook commented that one cannot help but note excuse me one cannot help but note that. The precision would have been higher still had the aircraft operated at lower altitude and greater risk. So this is interesting. It's like, yeah, you could still have been, if you took on more risk, you could have even killed more pe- people more carefully. But in some sense, the politicians and the commanders don't want to risk their own lives. And that's going to be a hard sell if you're going to tell them, well, no, you have to fly um, the more dangerous route, even though you're only possibly going to uh, not kill civilians. And that's because that's not a known thing. Actually, maybe it is known, so I shouldn't say that. Okay. The question is, of course, whether there is still such a trade-off between risks to oneself and risks to others when military use armed drones. Although the use of drones is primarily an effort to reduce the risk for one's own military personnel, it could have a reduction in the number of civilian ca- casualties as a collateral benefit. I just had thought there is a lot of risk here an awful lot of risk the more drones we use the easier it's going to be for everyone else to use them 
and I mean everyone else is seeing everything that's happening in Ukraine right now. The Bay Raktars have their own song. Everyone is going to know exactly how to do this. We are creating a huge, huge uh, font of knowledge that a lot of people are going to know how to fly military drones and a lot of people are going to know exactly what strategies to use military drones. A lot more people are going to die in the future because of how we are killing people now in Ukraine. So, we may not be getting risk, immediate risk, but we're going to get like some sort of uh, risk uh, coming down the line with this knowledge of how to kill people from a distance and we're not going to be able to prevent it. So, the idea that we're using all of this tech that's going to save our butts in the short term is probably going to be extremely dangerous in the long term. Like, extremely. Okay. A drone can, because it is unmanned, fly lower and slower than a manned aircraft, sending back high-resolution images to its operators who should then be able to better distinguish combatants from non-combatants. What is more, drone pilots, far from the actual battlefield, might be less affected by frustration, peer pressure, misplaced loyalties, or the wish for revenge than regular military personnel. At the... <coughs> yeah. I'm losing my voice. At the same time, it is clear that the use of drones does not meet Walter's accepting risk to oneself requirement. Bombing enemy targets from low-flying manned aircraft would indicate an acceptance of risk to oneself, but one might ask what the point is if that would bring a risk to the local population that is higher than the risks that the use of drones would pose. Rejecting the use of drones as a substitute for manned aircraft because their use is free of risk for its operators might boil down to accepting higher risk to oneself and the local population just to prove your valor. That is a distinctly, distinctively unsatisfying option, even if soldiers are in fact willing to run risks to prevent civ civilian casualties. What defines soldiers is not so much their acceptance of risk, but the restraint with which they exercise violence. Essential to the military profession is not so much the quintessential virtue of physical courage, but virtues of restraint, such as justice and temperaments. Yeah, this is the thing. This is what I was saying before. It's not that you're putting yourself at risk. It's that you have to have justice and temperance. You have to deal with other people as if they're people. But that's also very hard on the other side of a screen because the people are blips. And you can blow up blips very easily. I mean, I know everyone here has played a video game before. And of course, these are not video games that people are playing in the military. But separating yourself with them make, can, can do that for you. Okay. Discussion. But yeah, and so I, this is, I just want to reiterate, I don't think the idea that we are, I th that we're not having risk to ourselves. I think we're just delaying the risk to ourselves with a lot of these technologies. It's going to come back to bite us in the ass because, um, you know, there was what's it called? Uh, I'm looking at all this stuff in Ukraine. People were, you know, hooking, um, grenades to dr to drones and they were using off the shelf products to you know as delivery uh devices to um hold the grenade on the drone and so you're basically showing people how to make like really easy um ways to you know put a grenade where you want the grenade to go this is going to come back to like harm like uh the military's now or like civilians on our side so the idea that like we're not at, that th these technologies are riskless i think is just a uh, misapprehension that the risk is got to be immediate the risk is going to be uh delayed but it's going to be m probably worse it's going to be a slow boil all right discussion civilian casualties are all are of course to be avoided for what they are the loss of innocent lives but there are more pragmatic reasons too Walter thinks that a moral regard for civilians at risk is critically important in winning wider support for the war for any modern war. Viper says, This has got me thinking about the other discussion, ideology necessarily becoming an analog for people due to human, cognitive, or temporal limitations, which is why people are so quick to dehumanize even at a whiff of an ideology they disagree with, prevalent on the internet because it's a medium of concepts, not human connection. Both modern military and civilian life are 
So life, the scale leads to, yeah, <laughs> lead to the cyberpunk prophecy, high tech, low life. Yeah, we're already into the cyberpunk uh, world. It's, <clears throat> I think that's how it's going. But this is the part of the uh, goal, of course, with uh, the, a lot of these things is to get you to do what the ideology wants you to do. And these are different ways to do it. Either you get into like some sort of thing where it's us, them, they are the heathens, they can die because they're not real people or they're not the religious thing. Or in some sense, they are not real because we're just using our tech and this is just how we use our technology and we are disconnected from the human on the other side of it because we never see them as people because we are not near them. And we in some sense need uh, human interaction to actually feel like the other people are human. So, yeah. <clears throat> and this is the thing. I think we're getting into what I was just saying earlier. Regard for civ civilians matters because if you get yourself an insurgency on your hands, you're never going to win the uh, war. You're just going to be always repressing an insurgency until you get drained and you have to leave. And so this is a different aspect of how using drones is causing and like having a less regard for the civilians, the people there is a long term risk. OK, author says, I will call this the usefulness of morality. It's wide acknowledgement is something radically new in military history. Yeah, well, this is because militaries, I mean, you're not killing everybody anymore um, when you take over a place. You are trying to, you know, rule them. And it's not the same. So you have to make friends with those people. All right. Walter makes an important in it. Walter. Walter makes an important point here, considering that the recent wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have shown how civilian casualties can lessen support for a mission among the electorate at home. The military's attention for hearts and minds. Yes, yeah, this is it. Attention. So this is a longer term thing for hearts and minds was always mainly about the hearts and minds in areas of deployment that might no longer suffice. As Walter writes, the idea about the need for civilian support has turned out to be both variable and expansive. Modern warfare. This is modem warfare, not modern warfare. Modem, war, modem warfare requires the support of different civilian populations extending beyond the population of immediately at risk. That's too bad. This is, I'm pretty sure this means modern warfare, although modem warfare is a funny term for this sort of uh, drone warfare. You could call it modem warfare, too, for that matter. If you people are old enough to remember what a modem is. I guess they're still called modems, although they're built into the routers now. Okay, the question is whether the regard for local civilians that these different audiences want to see... Still must, come, uh, still must come at the cost of increased mil risk for military personnel. Today, the rise of unmanned systems means that the answer to this question is sometimes negative. Such systems make it possible to kill enemy combatants in a manner that brings no risk to one's own military personnel and reduces the risk to innocent bystanders at the same time. At least in theory, although drones might cause fewer might cause fewer civilian casualties than a manned aircraft would under the same circumstances, critics rightly point out that drones can also be used when using manned aircraft is out of the question, for instance, for targeting in countries we are not at war with, such as Pakistan or Yemen. Compared with not using force, using drones causes more civilian casualties. This also makes clear that distinguishing what a drone is from how it is used is somewhat artificial. That a drone is a weapon system that makes riskless killing possible clearly leads to it being used for operations that can be ethically questionable. That might at least partly explain why public opinion is averse towards killing that poses no risk to those who do the killing. George Lucas observed, writing about targeted killings by drones, that in the eyes of many people, this vast technology technological superiority and its reach, including the removal of any risk of harm to the military or civilian pursuers, seems grotesquely unfair, persecutory, oppressive, abusive, and therefore morally repugnant, reminding of the Death Star from Star Wars. <laughs> the George Lucas who speaks here is not the well-known director of Star Wars movies, but the slightly less famous military ethicist who bears that same name. That's good to know. I was really like, did George Lucas actually comment on uh, military uh, ethics? That would have been cool. 
Lucas rightly points to something now and then overlooked within the armed forces. Rationally, there may be nothing inherently wrong with riskless killing, but if the consequence is that the support for what the military is doing dwindles both at home and abroad, one might end up winning the battle but losing the war. The public is perhaps badly informed, writes Lucas, but that it does not alter the fact that as a result of the negative public sentiment, the po political and strategic price of riskless killing might sometimes outweigh the tactical gain. He would have cheered for the Gungans getting wiped out. Well, there you go. But this is the thing. Again, this isn't so much that you didn't put yourself at risk. It's that you didn't treat the other people's lives with uh, sufficient gravitas. It's like you didn't treat the other people's lives well. Like, you, no one wants to see civilian deaths. Because when you look at pictures of, like, civilians dying, it always looks the same. Like, people don't like... They, it looks terrible. And so... And so it's like the ability to kill without risk means, again, you're probably going to be a little bit sloppier in the way you're killing. There's nothing that will guarantee that you're going to be more careful. And that is the problem here is that when there is no risk to yourself, again, as the author had said, you don't, you're not flying as low as you can because you're saving yourself, but you're going to blow up more. Uh, you're going to blow up things uh, less discriminately. Okay. Lucas thinks that this might be a reason to not use drones in some circumstances, and this is certainly an option to consider. However, one could also argue that the military should not only restrain itself as far as the drone use of drones is concerned, but also explain itself better when they do use them. Instead of emphasizing that drones are not really different from manned aircraft, it should address the legitimate worries the public might have and point to the reasons why unmanned aircraft are used. Although it might be true that many people dislike the notions of riskless killing, they are equally averse to civilian casualties among the local population or military casualties on one's own side. The public sentiment against riskless killing is real and deserves to be taken seriously. In the end, it is society that decides on how and when it uses the military and where the limit limits on the use of force lie. Viper says, I wonder where the diff well, I wonder what the difference between people and the idea of people is. What is specifically that makes us care? Uh, I think you know very clearly that quite often people don't care. Like it's very easy to dehumanize uh, another group of people. Um very easy happens constantly and throughout history um so what exactly is it i don't know um but there's probably this idea of sentiment like what are we doing and why are we doing it like when people feel it at home in some sense they have to have some sort of like understanding that you know it's very easy to when people don't actually know what's happening in other places but when they start to think like oh those people are like us then it becomes different if as long as you can always keep them separate like those people are you know heathens they're not the uh you know they're not the religious people like us they're not the anointed by god they're whatever they're dogs they're animals whatever it is um as soon as you can break through that then they're going to think oh those are actually people but, you know, there's nothing that uh, is going to cause that to happen. There is, uh, what was it? We were reading a paper a while back. I don't know if you were here, but they were talking about who actually um, is a sort of a moral, like, who is a moral genius and who can actually see that, you know, they were talking about racism in, in America and, like, that some, like, kid started treating like the black kid in this is like in the south in like many years back he started treating him like he was an actual person as opposed to where everyone else would treat the african americans uh as lesser and so this was an example of a kid who actually saw something in the uh, other kid that he recognized in himself they were saying and therefore he treated him with empathy and respect and all that it was very rare and these examples are fewer and far between and so they were that argument was basically that you have to find some empathy but uh how do you find empathy i don't know and how do you get people to have empathy i don't know but like this is the thing this explaining of what are we doing killing people overseas um 
Yeah. No one likes the idea of killing people overseas unless you, you really think they're evil. But, uh... It's like, oh yeah, we killed those ants. Those We killed those cockroaches. But, like... I think that's getting harder to do now with modern media because you can actually see the people. Like, you can see what you were doing over there. You need a very controlled uh, population if they don't understand what, like, the place that you were looking at, what it was. And so it's like, as long as it's out of sight, it's out of mind. But once you can actually see the people and, like, see what they look like and, see, and hear what they have to say, it gets a lot harder to do that once uh, it's not out of sight and not out of mind. And so once you can start talking to this, these people, which we can do nowadays a lot easier than before because, you know, like someone in any number of countries could be watching me through Twitch. You could be doing that. But of course, there's a lot of places you can't watch through the Internet. And uh, yeah, it's like the U.S. blows up a lot of places and we do not see those people that we blow up. I'm sure they're very careful about not showing that sort of footage. Um yeah, and of course they have the uh, moral. They uh, don't show the soldiers coming back when they're dead too. Um, they don't want people to see that because they know it will uh, cause an outrage, and then they won't be able to um, continue their military operations. So yeah, but the idea that there's a specific what what the difference is between people and the idea of people, <sighs> I couldn't tell you. What makes us care? I mean, you, you, you appeal to words like empathy, but like I, I can't give you a what will, what makes you have empathy. I don't know. Okay. So, this is interesting. The question is, what is the uh, value of risk and war? And basically, it kind of guarantees that you actually are taking your job as seriously as possible. In terms of uh, treating other peoples with respect. And like their lives as valuable. And uh, the idea is that if you're a person in battle and you are there, you know, doing stuff, you can actually do that. And that's why, like, you know, as they said in the beginning, you don't shoot like someone bathing. Like, you don't, that's not a way, like, that person's not actively engaged against you. So you don't just kill them willy-nilly. But, like, this is the thing. How do you actually respect your enemy and respect yourself? But that's sort of irrelevant when you're trying to, you know, accomplish a political end. It's like, well, it doesn't matter how that actually happens. That's the Machiavellian point. But people actually do want to see that because they want to think that they're right, that they're on the just side of the war, that they're on the, uh, you know, the right side of history. And uh, killing civilians does not put you on the right side of history. And I think people know that now. Um, or at least they kind of mostly act that way. <sighs> so, yeah. So, if you have no skin in the game, how do you guarantee that you're actually acting as seriously uh, as possible? And I don't know. Yeah, see, ensuring public support will be even more relevant when... It is not if not if military start using autonomous weapons that make life and death decisions without a human in the loop. From the viewpoint of the military, resistance against such systems might seem more based on sentiment than on ratio. But here also, that is to an easy way out. So that's the thing. Are we going to just go give ourselves, uh, you know, Terminators? And be like, oh, we're going to just send that Terminator in. Terminator can figure out who's military and who's not. And it's just, uh, it'll just go kill everybody. It's like, that'll be great. But like, you see... It becomes very risky because, again, like I was saying earlier, you know, this stuff is going to get turned against us, too. And so it's like if we're doing it, it's going to happen against us eventually. And so I think the risk here is not so much. Um, it's not riskless. It's just delayed and where it's going to come back to bite you in ways you don't understand. And I think that's one of the problems here. Everyone is learning everything nowadays because of uh, modern technology and the internet everyone is learning everything and so the idea that we are n not at risk right now um when we are using all these techniques it just means it's going to come back um in ways we don't expect and so what counts as a safe distance i don't think we have any idea what a safe distance is here 
because it were it's only a distance in time. It's not a distance. It used to only be a distance in like physical, like uh, like in space. But I, I think at this point, the distance is really in time, and we're not. And the time when this is going to come back and get us is not that far off. So, um, that I think is the biggest issue here. Yeah. Space versus time. All right. But that's about it. And it is now 